Many things can weary our soul. Many times in life, we can get discouraged and down and feel like, what is going on? Why is so much happening around my life? You know, our hearts and our souls are important. What we think, what we feel, our emotions. Today, I just want to use a verse. We'll use other verses throughout, but I want to primarily concentrate on one verse in Scripture. It's a wonderful verse, and it's found in Galatians, the sixth chapter. You can turn to me if you like, but it's just one verse, but an important one. The title of this message is, Do Not Grow Weary. And the verse we'd like to read is from Galatians 6, verse 9, and it says this, And let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. In this magnificent verse, there is instruction, there's hope, and there's caution. Let's look, first of all, at instruction. It says, let us not lose heart in doing good. Let us not lose heart in doing good. Our very hearts, yours, mine, need to be held. We need to hold our heart. Be careful with our heart. King David, this magnificent and wonderful king, the first true king of Israel, certainly saw God at first, but David was the first of the line of Christ. David would always speak to his own heart. Are you aware of this? He was speaking to himself. Many of the Psalms reflect him turning to his own heart to speak to it. Let's look at what one of these magnificent Psalms says. Turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 42. The 42nd Psalm, as David is speaking here, He says there in verse 5, Why are you in despair, O my soul? (laughs) And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. Oh, my God. My soul is in despair within me. Therefore, I remember thee from the land of the Jordan and from the peaks of Hermon, from Mount Mazar, deep calls to deep. At the sound of thy waterfalls, all thy breakers and thy waves have Roll over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and his song will be with me in the night. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemies? As a shattering of my bones, my adversaries revile me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Then he turns right back to his own heart, his own soul. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. 
What a wonderful scripture. I want to ask us a question. This goes for myself as well. When was the last time you spoke, I mean really spoke, to your own heart? More than just tear up, you know. Where you really spoke to your own heart. Look at verse 11. Don't close it yet. Look at verse 11. Now look at it. Now look at it. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to read this verse 11 from Psalm 42 to our own selves. We're going to read it right now to our own heart. We're going to do it out loud, but remember who you're speaking to as we do this. Ready? Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. It says, let us not lose heart in doing good. So we're not meant to just be saved, although I pray you are. We're not meant to just be born again, although you sure better be. But in doing, doing what? Doing actively the will of God, the goodness of God, God's good. Now, it's more than just learning. And I'm someone that's spoken thousands of times through translators in many nations. But it's more than just learning. It says in 2 Timothy 3, 7, Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So I'm not just up here to fill the place with words. Any place. We need to be doing more than learning. We need to actively be doing the will of God. You know, I was in Lima, Peru. And this was when I was vice president of Promise Keepers. And we had this huge rally in the capital there in Peru. And there were all these speakers, maybe four or five of them, and I was the closing speaker. There was about 4,000 men jammed into this arena. And I was watching, I tend to do this, I was watching of how people were responding to the different speakers and what was going on, and a bunch of them were doing the normal thing of nodding off, and kind of half in, half out, and I'm thinking, I don't think this is what we're supposed to be doing. So I stand up there, and I say this, men... We need to be actively after the will of God now. You hundred, get out here. And there was a whole section of a hundred. I said, come out here right now. Hundred men stood up and they suddenly were looking at, well, what's going on? And they ran out into the middle of the arena. <laughs> hundred of them. I said, thank you. All the rest of the 3,900 are watching this deal. This actually happened. I shouldn't say I have fun, but I I do do some of this stuff. So these hundred guys are out there. And I said, could you men please form up? And there were boys there too, 12 years old and up. Could you men and young mighty men, could you form up into a a rectangle, if you will? And so they, best they could, they formed up. This was all going through Spanish translator, okay? This wasn't in English. This was, well, it was me in English, but they uh, they were translating everything I was saying. And they formed up into a rectangle. I said, okay, here's the deal. You need to protect each other. You need to actually be praying for each other. 
Your brother is important to you. That young man is important to you. That elderly man is important. It was a whole section had come out. Not pre planned I said, okay. Everybody on the outside of this perimeter start praying outward against the enemy of Christ. So the men turned and were all standing facing out and all of them were looking outward and all started to pray in Spanish. They started to pray and many of them out loud. That was great with me. And they're praying against Satan and praying against darkness. I said, now all you men, while these men are outside of the perimeter praying against Satan, all you men in the middle, I want you to put your hands up and pray that God would bless every man, young man in this group powerfully. So all the men put their hands up and begin to pray. Do you know what happened? The whole stadium started doing this. Every man and young man started putting their hands up and praying that God would bless and that God would protect the men around them. When we walked out of that room, those men were not the same. Nobody was asleep. Nobody was nodding off. You listen to this, right? No nighty night time. They came out of that stadium as warriors. Now, when it says to not lose heart in doing good, we as the people of God need to not just be learning. We need to be doing actively about the will of God. It says not to lose heart. Now, if it says not to lose heart, it means you had it once. Right? You can't lose something that you didn't ever have. It means you had heart. Turn over, if you will. I'll just read it for you. We can turn over, if you want to, to 2 Timothy. Let me just read this scripture from 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, verse 6 and 7. Just two quick verses. 2 Timothy, first chapter, 6 and 7. For this reason, I remind you, to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but a power and love and sound judgment. He's given us power. He's given us his love. He's given us sound judgment, not just judgment, but sound judgment. What instruction is in this wonderful scripture? Let us not lose heart in doing good. There's also, if you will, hope in this scripture, in this verse. It says this, in due time we shall read. Now, often God will have us reap here in this life. Often he will bless us. Often he will reward us. He will bring a return to us, a profit to us, if you will. But sometimes it's in due time. But you can believe he keeps his word. So there we were, Sandra and myself, Moscow, Russia. I don't know how many of you have ever been there during Soviet communism. It was awful. If you want to experience it, go to China or go to North Korea, if you can get in. But we were there in the height of communism, just as it was starting to break up. Mayak, Mayak, Mayak. Now, that means nothing to you, but if I said CNN, you would know what I'm talking about. If I had said Fox News, you'd know what I was talking about. If I said Bloomberg News or, or whatever, but if you're in Russia, Mayak. Mayak is the government network basically dominating what all the people here 
and think about. 24-7, round the clock, Mayak is played in most public squares in most of the cities. It goes across 11 time zones. It's big. 600 million people listen to it. They estimate that 98% of all 600 million listen to it. Has a massive, massive budget. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars budget. 53 languages it's translated into. Mayak, Mayak saying there's no God, dialectical materialism. When you die, you're just as dead as that piece of wood. Nothing different between that wood and you when you die. There is no afterlife. Mayak, Mayak, Mayak. So Sandra and I, we're in a cab. And we're going through the streets of Moscow on our way to meet with some folks. Now, at that point, I was the executive director of Spoken Word of God, and we had translated the Bible and put it on audio tape, this one used taped, in Russian. And we had a couple of these cassettes with us, you know, of the Bible in the Russian language, and this is thanks to Mr. Jack Turney and so many others, but we had a few, and we were going to take it to a little church so they could play the scripture. Mike was blaring over the radio. This little voice says, Paul, it's of course coming from Sandra. I love when she says Paul. Southern accent. Anyway, she says, have you ever thought of getting the reading of the Bible on Mayak? I <laughs> said, Sandra, Sandy, that, that, that can't possibly happen. It's a communist station. They're not going to put the Bible on Mayak. That's completely impossible. Isn't it? You know what she said to me? I don't think so. Long story short, the next Sunday morning... I stood in front of First Baptist Moscow, 5,000 member church. And before I started my message, I said, I have an announcement. We have negotiated a contract this week with Mayak to have the scriptures read over Mayak every Sunday morning going forward. Now half the room jumped and began to rejoice and clap and were excited. But probably the more significant half of the room began to weep. It was a sound like you can't imagine of rejoicing and weeping at the same time. When you think of the persecution under Soviet communism that they had endured and the amount of time they had prayed and waited on God. In due time, say it with me, we shall reap. The great reaping of God. The Romans held these games around the time the Apostle Paul was alive. And when the victor would be recognized, they had a raised podium, a platform. And they called it the Bema Seat. And the winner would come up in front of the officials to receive his 
wreath, the winner. Come up to the Bema seat, the raised platform of reward and gift. The Apostle Paul talks about the great Bema seat of God, the great raised platform that the believer will someday step onto. Turn with me to Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60. You talk about reaping. Look at this prophecy from Isaiah 60. I'm going to read a whole chunk of verses here, maybe six verses. They're long verses. Turn with me to Isaiah 60. Look at this scripture. Isaiah 60, verse 1 says, Arise, shine, for your light is come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth. Boy, is that getting ready to happen. It's already happening in front of us. For behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness, the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you. And his glory will appear upon you. And nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see they all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come from afar and your daughters will be carried in the arms. Then you will see and be radiant. And your heart will thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of nations will come to you. A multitude of camels will cover you and young camels of Midian and Epith. All those from Sheba, remember the queen of Sheba? Anyway, all those from Sheba will come. They will bring gold and frankincense and they will bear good news of the praises of the Lord. There's hope for the believer. Are you one? Are you one? Are you a believer? Oh, okay. I think it was a nod. I think you almost said yes. It was close, but yeah. I, I mean, if, if, you're a, <laughs> if you're a believer, there, there's hope. The scripture is packed with your tomorrow, your future, what is coming Look at the scripture we just finished reading from Isaiah 60. It's just gigantic. But the same verse from Galatians 6, 9 also has a caution in it. Yes, it has instruction. Yes, it has hope. But the same verse, Galatians 6, 9, also has a caution. Because it says, if we do not lose heart. Ah, oh, I've seen so much of the weary Christian. And I've seen so much, and I, you probably have as well, so much of weary Christianity. Weary of doing good. Weary of keeping the faith. Weary of waiting for the rapture. Weary. And so now we have to help God out. We have to make Christianity palatable is what's happened in our weariness. Make God into a nice guy if you will, a hologram Christ, empty of the real Christ. I think if I had to put it terribly, I would flip the scripture around to denote what's happening in this culture, and I would say, the culture believes this. Let us make God in our image. Let us make God in our image. We want to have a relatable religion, 
seeker-sensitive and culturally attractive. But I would call us today to something quite different. I would call us to finish strong. Look at the Apostle Paul. Turn with me, if you will, back to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, 4th chapter. 2 Timothy 4. It's towards the end of your Bible. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6, 7, and 8 says these words. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Verse 8. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have Loved his appearing. Church, I would call you to finish strong. You know, in high school, I used to run track. I'll close with this little story. (laughs) And I liked the sprints. Actually, I only liked the 100 yard sprint, (laughs) it was over real quick. And I, I used to, to love to do it. Sandra was there with me, and she was cheering me on. But anyway, and I remember getting down at the starting line and getting those blocks, getting ready for the 100-yard race. And, I, you know, in the words of Eric Little, the, the great Scottish runner, he says, I guess I won't be seeing you until after the race is over. <laughs> in other words, he was going to be in front of him the whole race. <laughs> But I used to get down there and get ready to explode. Everybody else is kind of fiddling around. All I could think about was exploding out of those blocks. And when the gun went off, I tried to anticipate as best I could, so I was at least on top of it. I was often getting a false start and I had to go ahead and try it again. But anyway, boom, it would go off, and I would slam out of there and push as fast and as hard as I possibly could. Took a number of first places. But I remember thinking, oh, I can make it for the 100 yards. I know I can make this at full blast. And I I got within about nine-tenths of a second of the world record. Not, Of course, in the 100-yard dash, that means somebody's way in front of you. (laughs) But I got close. One day I raced against a guy who had had Olympic championship times and I'm thinking man this guy but we went at it and I stayed right with him and of course he beat me but it was close got within about a half a second of the world record but you know the coach was always never satisfied with me running the 100 yard dash Okay, that was nice. You got another victory. Great. But you need to get ready for the 220-yard dash. (laughs) I'm thinking, I used to hate the 220-yard dash. Why? Because there was no let up. You had to go just as fast for 220 yards as you did for 100 yards. It was horrible. It was exhausting. Now, I don't know, a bunch of you guys out there might be, or, or ladies might be track stars, know what I'm talking about. But the 220, I believe, was the race that put so much into my heart and soul as a man. Because I knew I could do the 100-yard full bore. But to go double and a little more, oh, really, really difficult. Remember one day passing the tape and the time came back that I'd been on the same pace that I used to run the 100. And I'm thinking, wow. Can I just tell you, church, 
I'm pretty convinced the Christian life is not the 100-yard dash. As much as you might enjoy blasting out and getting it over with, I'm convinced it's the longer race to push all the way through. Let's go back in conclusion to the scripture we've been talking about all morning here. It says, let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. So I call us to Lima, Peru. I call us to Mayoc. And Sandy's words, I don't think it's impossible. I call us to the 220, the whole race that you and I can finish strong. Lord bless you.